Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, presentation, Open Source Auditory Models, Normal and Hearing Impaired Processing, which is going to be given by Fotis Dracopoulos and myself, Alejandro Osses. This is the outline of what we will cover. And in short, we will give um, approximately 15 minutes long introduction of uh, the auditory system, um, which will be followed by a, a question and answer section. Then uh, we will split into two breakout rooms uh, where uh, uh, demonstrations in Python and MATLAB will be given. Uh, then we will again have a time for some questions and we will summarize all of the, of the outcomes uh, in the last five, five minutes of the presentation. I want to start by showing this diagram of the auditory system and um, in uh, short, this, the auditory system can be uh, split into two parts, the mechanical part and the neural part. In the coming slides, I will focus in the mechanical part where uh, much more research has been conducted in the, let's say, past 60 years. And uh, the neural part will be only covered very briefly. Uh, also, Fotis will dedicate some words about it. But a concept that is uh, recurrently used in the uh, literature the concept of uh, internal representation. And that's a very generic concept. Uh, once we have a sound coming into the auditory system and we approximate it, an internal representation is sometimes referred to as any approximation of the sound as it would look like through all the mechanical parts or neural parts of the auditory system. The mechanical part where I'm going to focus in the coming slides is composed by the outer ear, and middle ear and the inner ear. And in the inner ear is where the, the sounds are decomposed in different frequency ranges uh, before they are um, converted into neural patterns. Some of the models that we will show uh, are um, reach some kind of approximation of what is believed to happen at uh, higher levels of the auditory system, uh, going to the cochlear nucleus and inferior colliculus. But let's start then with the mechanical part. And as input to the mechanical part, uh, we have to talk about waveforms. And waveforms are um, a way to express the uh, pressure variations in air as they arrive to our ears. Uh, on the left side, you can see a representation of uh, this English sentence. And uh, it might be a familiar view if you use uh, processing software such as Pratt or a, even any audio editor. Now, if we zoom into a small section of this sentence, we can see that actually the amplitudes are highly uh, variable in time. And the auditory system is not always as quick as the waveform themselves, uh, waveforms themselves to follow these variations. So that's why we need some type of approximation. In uh, the coming uh, slides, I will also show a small spectrogram which will be uh, shown to uh, emphasize some frequency variations in the approximations of the, uh, each uh, auditory stage. I will start with the outer ear filtering. So the outer ear is composed by the pinna and the auditory canal ending at the tympanic membrane. And as you can see here, this acts as a kind of tube that uh, would resonate at some specific frequency. So if we now focus on the spectrogram and the waveform, and we compare it with the input uh, um, waveform, you can see that there is some emphasis at the region of uh, about three kilohertz. So in a sense, uh, the, in the most simplistic way, the outer ear filtering can be approximated as a filter with an emphasis in that region. After uh, we go through the uh, ear canal, then we have the middle ear. And the middle ear is um, in charge of um, acting as an uh, impedance adapter between a medium where air is uh, moving to the inner um, ear where fluid based uh, fluids are being moved inside the structure. It's composed by three bones, and at the end of this structure. Uh, one of the physiological outputs comparable to this point is the stapes velocity. If you look at the waveform that I uh, drawn here, we again compare it with the previous slide, we can see that this acts 
or in the most simplistic way, can be approximated as a bandpass filter with a um, center frequency at about 800 hertz. Now, if we go uh, more uh, inside uh, to the cochlea, where uh, we, uh, in, the, in a simplistic way, we see it as a frequency analyzer. Sounds are um, decomposed in frequency components with uh, base most uh, uh, locations um, being related to higher frequencies. And um, as you go through the apex, apex, uh, then uh, it will uh, contain more low frequency content as it's shown from top to down in this diagram. Connected to the basilar membrane uh, are the uh, inner hair cells. The inner hair cells are the uh, very last mechanical uh, processing stage before uh, it goes to the uh, auditory nerve. I'm going to talk about this. Another structure that Fotis will talk about uh, will be the outer uh, hair cells. And outer and inner hair cells are both related to uh, sensory neural hearing loss in the most typical way of introducing it, at least in this type of models. So let's go to the inner hair cells. The inner hair cells. Um, uh, produce some kind of uh, membrane potential changes uh, near the um, auditory nerve synapses that might uh, produce, uh, may or may not produce some uh, auditory nerve fiber patterns. In the most simplistic way, this is simulated as a, wave, a half wave rectification, followed by uh, low pass filtering in a way that, for example, for higher frequencies, as shown here, uh, this uh, approximates a kind of envelope extractor. Um, and uh, some more detailed information is kept for low frequencies. But if you compare with the representation that I showed for the cochlear filter bank, um, you may see that uh, only uh, the positive phases are kept. Um, and now I would like to give the pass uh, the words to uh, Fotis, who will talk a little bit about hearing loss and will continue this uh, conceptual uh, introduction. So Alejandro did a good job at explaining how the other system works and how it transforms sound uh, into electrical signals uh, via the cochlear mechanics and hair cells, which is then transmitted to the brain through the auditory nerve. And in this slide, uh, is shown a cross section through the cochlear turns, which essentially visualizes these three major structural components that are responsible for the mechanoelectrical transduction of sound the outer hair cells, the inner hair cells, and also the afferent outer nerve fiber synapses. And these uh, peripheral components are very important for auditory processing and perception, and are also the components that are uh, impaired uh, with sensory neural hearing loss after aging or noise exposure. And specifically, uh, what, what has been studied the most in terms of hearing loss has been the uh, outer hair cell loss or cochlear gain loss, which is associated with uh, a loss of audibility and is clinically diagnosed by uh, an audiogram as shown in this uh, figure here, where uh, we lose our ability to uh, hear soft sounds, especially at high frequencies. Uh, and this happens uh, with aging. But cochlear gain loss or other hair cells loss is also associated with more uh, nonlinear effects, uh, such as uh, frequency selectivity uh, distortions, or also the broadening of the filters in the basilar membrane, where a simple diagram here shows how uh, the tuning of the basilar membrane of a normal hearing cochlea, which is uh, quite selective in frequency, uh, get smooth to respond to all sorts of frequencies after hearing loss. Another part of hearing loss that has been recently studied and uh, has been hypothesized to be linked with difficulties in understanding speech and noise and generally in everyday listening conditions is the loss of inner hair cells and also the uh, damage to the 
synapses, the outer nerve synapses, uh, the so-called cochlear synaptopathy. And as I said, this is something more recently studied, so uh, the effects of this are not still uh, well known. And all these include the effects of cochlear damage after hearing loss, but we should note here that uh, there are also changes in the plasticity of the brain after cochlear damage that come after the auditory nerve, uh, such as central gain, which can also have an effect on how our perception of sound is distorted after uh, aging or noise exposure. And researchers have tried to study all these parts of the auditory system all these years and to develop models to help us understand how we perceive and process sound and also how hearing loss affects uh, our auditory processing. And here we will focus on uh, the moral, monaural processing of sound uh, and monaural models, but uh, I should mention that binaural processing of audio is also important, and there are uh, models that can uh, approximate this as well. But since monaural processing comes uh, before binaural integration, it is important to understand uh, this part first. So there have been many different uh, models developed uh, through all these years, ranging from simpler uh, to more complex descriptions. And uh, one category of these models is functional uh, descriptions, which uh, try to simulate the functional properties of the auditory system, uh, and with the ultimate goal to simulate behavioral performance and auditory perceptual outcomes. And a good example is the model uh, presented by Relanio Ebora et al., which uh, essentially describes all these different parts of the auditory system that uh, Alejandro went through uh, with its different stages, uh, with the ultimate goal of predicting speech intelligibility. And an important aspect of this model is also that cochlear gain loss can be introduced to simulate uh, impaired speech intelligibility. But there are also more complex uh, descriptions of auditory processing, such as by physically inspired models. Uh, a good example is the model by Zilan et al., which have been widely used uh, across academia and industry. And these kind of models try to uh, describe uh, into detail the physio physiological properties of uh, our auditory system and also how hearing loss can be introduced uh, separately in all these different stages of auditory processing, namely the cochlear inner carousel and uh, auditory nerves that I uh, mentioned before. And Alejandro has done a good uh, uh, attempt in uh, describing all these different models and uh, their, the purposes, the different purposes that these models can be uh, used for in the study mentioned here. But, I should mention that auditory models have been widely used in many different applications, uh, where functional models have been used to design MP3 algorithms, speech enhancement, automatic speech recognition, and also more by physically inspired models uh, of hearing impaired auditory processing have been used in uh, hearing aid development. But all of these existing auditory models have been hand designed to reproduce specific biophysical or perceptual phenomena and also generic effects of hearing loss, which do not necessarily match all the nonlinear transformations of sound that happen within the auditory pathway. And this means that no model is really perfect and different models can be better suited for different applications. Uh, but recent advances in machine learning uh, have the potential to provide tools to describe the whole nonlinear mapping of sound to uh, neural activity. And this can be done by training models to learn the transformation directly from data, which need to be representative and um, carefully designed to um, include all these different sound phenomena that have been studied over all these decades. And modelers have trying to identify and simulate. And the recent example is our uh, recently published ICNET model, which uh, simulates neural activity uh, as recorded in the brain of different gerbils uh, and can simulate essentially the neural responses in the inferior colliculus in response to any sound waveform. 
So with that, I'd like to point out that there have been numerous other models that have been developed over all these decades. And we made an effort to compile a list with uh, most of these models on uh, the GitHub link, the GitHub repository that we have linked here. And now we will move to the hands-on demonstration part of this workshop, where we will split into two uh, breakout rooms to demonstrate different use cases of auditor models. The one uh, room will be led by Alejandro, uh, where uh, the, the aim is to simulate the responses of an auditory model uh, using the auditory modeling toolbox. And to demonstrate the effects of hearing loss on the internal representations of this model. And the other room will be led by me and will be focused on Python and how hearing loss can be simulated on directly on an audio signal and how our recent, uh, recently developed ICNet model can be used to simulate neural response in the brain in response to these sounds. <laughs> 